This is the scene of Britain's largest ever political massacre and it was a massacre. It's the closest the country has ever got to a revolution of the people by the people. This is Peter's Field and this is the site of Peterloo, the Manchester Massacre. Today, Manchester is known around the world for some amazing things, scientific breakthroughs, rich industrial heritage, music and football. But it's also the cradle of modern day social liberalism, of working class struggle for freedom and equality. Now of all the things that have happened in this great city, perhaps the most significant of all was when the struggle for British democracy reached a bloody and horrific peak. Between 60 and 80 thousand people gathered here in the heart of the modern day city at a political rally of local and national social reformers. They would leave screaming panicked at the arrival of dozens of sword-bearing cavalry who charged into the masses and began cutting people down. The date was the 16th of August 1819, 200 years ago this year, and that date would forever be remembered as the Peterloo Massacre. At the start of the 19th century, Britain's parliamentary system was corrupt, run by the landed gentry and the royalty. It was full of something called rotten boroughs, places of tiny electorates and tiny populations that wielded disproportionate power over the parliamentary system. So no more was this worse than in Lancashire, which only had two members of parliament and only adult men with a certain horde of land could vote. Now you have to remember at this time, the populations of Manchester and the surrounding towns of Oldham, Rochdale, Ashton, Salford, Bolton and Blackburn had a combined population of over a million people. Manchester's population had increased sevenfold in the last century, yet all these were represented by just two MPs. Something had to change. At the same time, the Napoleonic Wars had come to an end in 1815 and everyone expected things to improve economically. Instead, there was economic depression, especially in Lancashire, among the weavers and spinners. Then came the Corn Laws of 1815, which imposed a high tariff on imports of grain. However, British grain was poor quality and sold at an incredibly high price compared to foreign imports. And so the price of everyday food bills went up. So this is the scene at the start of the century. Poor people are leaving the farms and the fields and moving to the city, desperate to earn more money. Now the population of urban centres begins to boom. So none of them have the vote, quality of life is extremely poor and they have no say whatsoever over their own futures. Now the price of grain has shot up and they can barely afford to feed them and their families. It's no surprise then that storm clouds were brewing. The system had to look after their interests as well as its own. Amongst the cotton mills and coal mines of Lancashire, a wave of political reform was swelling calls for a change to the way that the country was run, for better representation and votes for all. Now the British government were absolutely terrified of a revolution of working people sweeping the country like it had in France only years before. A sense of desperation and panic began to grip those in Westminster and the Royal Palace. Manchester magistrates warned that a general rising was imminent, blaming the press and a few bad apples for agitating the working classes. Radicals in the Manchester Patriotic Union wanted to organise a huge gathering in the city centre in the summer of 1819 and one of the people they wanted on the bill was famed reformist Henry Hunt. Secretary of the Union and founder of the radical Manchester Observer newspaper wrote to Hunt saying this The state of this district is truly dreadful and I believe nothing but the greatest exertions can prevent insurrection. Oh, that you in London were prepared for it. Now unfortunately, the letter was intercepted by government spies and the 15th Cavalry was sent to the city in preparation for an insurrection. So on the morning of the 16th of August 1819, workers and poor people from all over descended on Manchester. Now they've been practicing for weeks, marching regimentally and in an orderly fashion in fields all over the region. They came from everywhere. The largest contingent of 10,000 or so marching from Oldham, Saddleworth and Mosley to the east. Many thousands more poured in from Stockport, Wigan, Bolton, Rochdale and Middleton, the latter led by the prominent reformist Samuel Bamford. 
By midday, between 70 and 80,000 people had gathered in the city centre. The rest of the city was described as like a ghost town at the time. It was perhaps the greatest meeting of people that had ever taken place in Britain. Now imagine it, a crowd the likes of which had never been seen before, taken to the streets demanding justice. And historians argue again and again that this wasn't a big political movement, it wasn't a revolution uh, on the cusp of a revolution, that these people were just there for a rally, a political rally. But these people had marched for miles, for hours to get here. This wasn't just some little thing that they weren't bothered about. This was the first stirrings of, of social, political revolution. So most people weren't armed. A lot of them were wearing the best clothes, the Sunday best. Uh, this was an event like no other. It was a celebration of something the crowd thought they never had, unity and strength. It was also very much the debut of the first female reform societies, which were established in the area. Members of the Manchester Female Reform Society gathered around the hustings dressed in white and the secretary, Mary Files, rode atop Henry Hunt's carriage holding their flag. Right, so I'm in the heart of the modern day Manchester city centre and behind me as you can see is the Manchester Central, the old railway station, it's huge and it dominates the scene here. Um, I'll just show you around a little bit. This behind me is Windmill Street. That was there originally back in the day. And over there is Lower Mosley Street. Uh, we've got the Midland Hotel there. Um, what used to be the Theatre Royale, it's not anymore. And then the Radisson Hotel just there. So just to give you a basic idea of whereabouts I am in the city, uh, behind this building here is Manchester Central Library, the famous round central library and adjacent to that is St Peter's Square. But none of these buildings were here back in the day, in 1819, none of these were here. This was just an open croft, a bit of open land um, in the heart of the city, surrounded by warehouses and uh, storerooms and workshops. Only one building around here still survives from that fateful day, and that is the Friends Meeting House. And it's just over there, it's about 150 meters that way. So imagine all this just swept away from Watson Street down there, where them trees are, all the way to the Midland Hotel, and from where I'm standing now, all the way back to the Friends Meeting House. Just completely empty. Okay, so all this was open croft, uh, surrounded by workshops and what have you. But just there where the Midland Hotel is, was a, a walled garden um, and a row of houses, well-to-do houses, uh, known as Cooper's Cottages. And it was in one of those houses that local magistrates gathered uh, to watch proceedings from the window. And as soon as the crowd began to swell in any type of number, uh, a cordon, a double cordon of special constables stretched from the house all the way so the hustings which are all the way down there, 200 or so special constables and he created a kind of corridor uh, so that when the speakers turned up at the hustings down there they could easily be arrested through the crowd. Of all the disputed accounts of that day the one thing that generally is agreed upon is that this uh, location is where the hustings was, this point here which is just at the corner of the Radisson Hotel today uh, was where the carriages were set up, the hustings were set up for Henry Hunt and Mary Files and all the rest of the speakers to speak from. So the crowd, the 60 to 80,000 people would have been all around here, all around this area, hoping to hear from Henry Hunt and the rest uh, speaking at this point. So the Manchester Yeomanry were made up of local men uh, who hated the radicals, businessmen and self-important fawning young men uh, who liked the status of being on the side of the government. So very quickly, let me just show you where all this happened in the modern day city. Um, this, of course, is a close-up of Peter's Street um, and St. Peter's Square, just there, the Central Library, and at the bottom of the picture, Manchester Central Station, the old railway station there. Now, the Friends Meeting House, the old Quaker Meeting House, is still there today. It's the only building left in the area today. That's highlighted in yellow. Then over here in St. Peter's Square, there used to be, of course, St. Peter's Church. Now, where the Midland Hotel is today, there used to be a walled garden, walled off from the public. Um, and right there as well, on the corner of the Midland, were the houses 
where the magistrates gathered to watch over the scene. And over here on Windmill Street, as we've already seen, the corner of the modern day Radisson Hotel is where the hustings was, where the speakers were going to gather um, and speak to the crowd. The crowd here highlighted in orange between 60 and 80,000 people packed into that small space in the city centre. And finally, these areas shown in white were the buildings there at the time. As soon as Henry Hunt arrived, the magistrates heard the enthusiastic crowd reaction and demanded the arrest of him and all the speakers on the hustings. Two notes were sent out, one to the Yeomanry in Pickford Yard, the other to Cavalry waiting off Key Street. Pickford Group got their note first and drew the weapons before racing on towards the crowd. On their way, a woman was knocked down and the two-year-old in her arms was thrown onto the floor. The boy, William Files, would become the first to die that day, but not the last. They left the magistrate's house and proceeded towards the hustings to make the arrest, but became stuck moving through the crowd. They then began hacking at people with their sabres to try and get through. Once the arrests were made, they went for the banners. Still frustrated at the crowd, the yeomanry were said to have lost all command of temper, riding roughshod into the fleeing people hacking and hacking at anyone and everyone they saw. The cavalry from Key Street arrived about 10 minutes later and were ordered by the magistrates to wade in and help disperse the crowd. At the same time, the Cheshire Yeomanry, arriving on the scene, charged from the southern edge of the field and foot soldiers drew their weapons and blocked access onto Peter Street. The panicked, fleeing crowd had very few places to run. Chaos now took over. Now, it was never established how many people died that day, but it was at least 15. Uh, one of those who died was John Lees, uh, a survivor of the Battle of Waterloo, who was struck twice in the head by a sabre and sent home early by a cold-hearted doctor who didn't agree with his uh, attending the rally. Now another victim was Mary Hayes, who lived just down the road, uh, off Oxford Road. Now she was heavily pregnant at the time, she was a mother of six, and she was trampled by cavalry. Um, she survived that day, uh, but she was so badly injured that when a baby was born prematurely in December of that year, uh, she died during childbirth. So this map here was the first to be published and appeared in the Radical Manchester Observer, whose editor James Rowe provided the earliest detailed account of what he called the Manchester Massacre. He detailed several key buildings in the area, including St Peter's Church at the top of Oxford Road, the Friends Meeting House and Cooper's Cottages. You can see the masses of people in the middle there, and also the lines of troops and cavalry stationed on nearby streets, ready to strike when commanded. Rowe was horrified at the day's events, and let that show in the map. Here, for example, he shows Manchester Yeomanry cutting at men and women, heaped on each other before the houses. And here, he describes foot soldiers and dragoons striking and intercepting fugitives, people trying to run away to safety. Now, this second map was produced by the Geographer Royal, James Wilde, who produced maps for the army. This one shows the area in some detail, but lacks any sort of commentary. You can see it's orientated the other way to the first map, but both agree on the general features of the scene, including the placement of the hustings. Now, the future editor of the Manchester Guardian newspaper, which hadn't been founded yet, was a man called John Edward Taylor. Now, he was present on the day of the massacre and he coined the term Peterloo, a reference to Waterloo. Now, he was so disgusted by what he saw that day that he wrote scathing attacks against officials and turned the Manchester Guardian into the leading radical reformist paper of its time. Now, over the years, the case was examined in court six times, but nobody was ever found guilty. Justice was never served for the 15 or so people killed that day and the hundreds who were injured. The strange thing is, nobody's ever put a memorial here to commemorate the dead. There's one being built over there behind me uh, for the bicentennial, but it's embarrassing that we've had to wait 200 years just to get it. So the city itself would struggle to come to terms with the massacre. Although it continued to be a nurturing ground for radical revolutionary thinking. Now, of course, in the decades that followed Peterloo, uh, Manchester would experience an economic boom like never before, becoming uh, the hub, the centre of the Industrial Revolution, a pioneering city of industry. St Peter's Field disappeared into what you see today, with the building of the Free Trade Hall, the Theatre Royale, and so on. Cooper's Cottages were demolished, and the Midland Hotel was eventually built. St Peter's Church itself was also demolished and Manchester Central Station was built adjacent to the site, dominating the scene. Eventually the city moved on as the economic boom swept it away and it had finally learned to shake off the shackles of the landed gentry, the aristocrats of southern England and the so-called nobility. 
Now the Manchester Guardian remained a left-leaning radical paper, um, eventually moving to London, abandoning its roots in Manchester. Um, unfortunately today it's more of a centrist voice, it's sort of lost that uh, socialist, that progressive voice and it's, it's a very much a centrist political paper. Now Mancunians and the people of Lancashire have always been a left-leaning, progressively minded people, always open to the struggles of others. Which is why it's kind of sad today because the British people in general have lost that social, that drive for social justice and progress. Um, I think it's kind of easy today to relax into what we've got and forget that things aren't yet equal and that people are still exploited and homeless um, and that rich people are getting richer off the backs of poor people. And that the rights we currently have today are through centuries of our ancestors' blood, sweat and tears. No better is this shown than during the American Civil War when Manchester Mills refused to buy cotton off the slave plantations of the Confederate slave-owning states. And the reason there's a statue of Abraham Lincoln in the city, not far from the site of Peterloo. Which is why it's very, very sad today to see working class people from Lancashire and socially deprived parts of the UK voting for right-wing candidates, whether it's conservative or far-right candidates even. People who promised to go back to the good old days when business could be business and free market capitalism could prevail. Because places like Manchester didn't get to where they are today. Diverse, artistic, inventive, uh, fiercely independent, just by doing what they were told. Today we have lots of working rights as well as universal suffrage, but it's clear that the mass of the people is unable to exercise real political power through the parliamentary system. We're still ruled by the same people as we were 200 years ago. Britain is essentially still corrupted in favour of the wealthy. Because if there's one lesson to be learned from the Peterloo Massacre in 1819, it's that people with all the power and the money won't simply share the wealth without a fight. Freedom isn't free, it's very easily lost when poor people go around blaming each other for the problems caused by the privileged few. So if you think of all the rights and privileges we've got today in the 21st century Britain, uh, from working standards, uh, minimum wage and five day working week, all the way to women's suffrage or gay rights, trans rights, environmental rights, environmental protections and freedoms, all of these things were fought for by people like those who campaigned at Peterloo, the reformists and the chartists. That's why we must never forget Peterloo because it's a great lesson in freedom and equality and the struggle of people over power. Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. So if you liked the video, please give us a like and subscribe um, and leave a comment if you want. Uh, thanks very much for watching Be Here Now and I'll see you next time. See you later.